Welcome back to the Western Museum of Flight for another private tour. I'm Cindy Maka, the director. Back by popular demand, Roy Martin will regale us with the story of the SHAPE sonic boom test demonstration. Hey, welcome to the Western Museum of Flight. I'm Roy Martin, one of the docents here at the museum. Today I'd like to feature our F-5 again. Uh, the F-5 has gone through several modifications uh, through, its life, uh, through its life as an aircraft and a lot of those modifications was done on the nose of the aircraft. And the reason the airplane was a, a good a candidate for having nose modifications because the designers right here put in a point that make it fairly easy to take this part of the nose off and underneath here is a very strong bulkhead. So you could bring in other nose shapes and attach to that bulkhead and structurally the airplane would be sound to fly. For example, the RF-5E was an example where the basic F5 removed the nose and a new nose shape come in that had windows and a platform so that they could mount cameras and then this become the tactical reconnaissance version of the F5 they call the RF5E. Another example and the one I'll talk about quite a bit today is probably the most extensive modification that was ever done to the F5 and that's this shape that you see here and it's classically called the F5 shaped sonic boom demo. This uh, particular project occurred in the early uh, 2000s, 2001 to 2004, and the purpose was to try to demonstrate that through specialized aircraft shaping, it may be possible to quiet the sonic boom. So what's a sonic boom and how was it possible that they might want to quiet it? Well, when an airplane flies through the air, it kind of puts out a pressure pulse and creates a wave ahead of the airplane, not unlike a boat going through water has a bow wave. But when you, when you approach Mach 1, which is approximately 767 miles per hour, the airplane effectively catches up with its bow wave and now starts to produce a pressure pulse a little thin region of discontinuity of the air then starts to emanate from the airplane and this is a, an increase in pressure or a pressure pulse and this pulse goes in all directions but it's the pulse that comes down towards the ground that's a problem because anybody on the ground would hear this airplane going supersonic they would perceive it in their ear as a boom now there's actually two booms associated with every airplane going supersonic they have a forward shock, if we say, and a rear. These, these, these pressure pulses are called shock waves. So a forward shock wave when the, airplane, when the air mass goes from subsonic to supersonic, and then a rear shock wave when the air mass returns back to the subsonic. So this boom, boom is associated with every airplane. Now, if you have a fighter type airplane, the two sonic booms are so close together because of the short coupling of the aircraft that you often just hear a single kaboom. But when the space shuttle used to come back into Edwards Air Force Base, which was a very large vehicle going supersonic, you could definitely hear the boom, boom sound. Now the problem is with supersonic flight is these booms are very irritating and very startling to people and people don't like to have to, to listen to them. So consequently, there's a federal law that says you're not allowed to go supersonic over the United States, except in little restricted areas that are used primarily for military aircraft training operations. But other than outside of those areas, which are generally in areas of very little population, but for the most part, over the United States, no supersonic flying. And that also applies to Europe. Now, wouldn't it be uh, nice if we could quiet that sonic boom and allow airplanes to go supersonically? So there was a theory that aero uh, engineers had uh, in the 50s and the 60s that said, hey, we might be able to shape an airplane and control the sonic boom around this airplane and actually quiet that sonic boom to acceptable levels. And the theory worked from this. Every protrudence coming out of this airplane, whether it be the nose, the canopy, the inlets, the wing, anything sticking out in the atmosphere actually creates a shock wave. And the faster the plane goes, the stronger these pressure pulses or these shock waves are. Now these shock waves have a characteristic because when they come off of the plane and start to go down to the ground, 
they migrate to either the front or the back shock wave and they collace. And collace means they actually add energy or add on to it and make the shock wave stronger as these various uh, small shock waves uh, approach these and they end up with a very strong shock wave that can get to the ground and is very irritating. So the theory was, is it possible through special aircraft shaping to control these shock waves so that they essentially stay parallel, they don't collace, and if that's the case, these small shocks would dissipate in the atmosphere, especially if you're flying 30,000 feet or higher, and therefore, if these small shock waves dissipate in the atmosphere, all that you're left with is a small shock wave in the nose and tail, and maybe that'll just produce a very slight rumble that uh, would be very hard to hear. So that was the theory. Can you specially shape an airplane to control these shock waves and possibly re reduce the intensity of the sonic boom? So DARPA, that's the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, that's the military agency that funds re, uh, research projects, funded a project and, uh, uh, to do this particular supersonic research, to do a special shaping of an airplane. Northrop Grumman was chosen uh, after a little competition among the contractors to do this project using an F-5 aircraft. So the concept being the F-5 had already had prior nose modifications, and this would just be another mo nose modification. The intent was to try to control the intensity of this nose shock, but in the, in the process, the, the modification would stop just forward of the main landing gear so that the landing gear and the flight controls would not be affected by the modification. So that was the intent of the project. Northrop then, the Northrop Grumman engineers then, to do this, to come up with this special shaping, did the following. They took a basic F-5, we flew it up over Edwards Air Force Base, had a specially modified F-15 that had a very long nose, or very long probe on it. That F-15 then, with this F-5 flying at a representative condition, 1.4 Mach at 32,000, this F-15 came through and measured every single shock wave that was coming off of that uh, F-5 aircraft and exactly how strong that shock wave was. So now that they had essentially established um, uh, the characteristic of the airflow around the airplane going supersonic, then they took that data and loaded it on a computer. This computer then represented mathematically the supersonic airflow around the airplane at this flight condition, 1.4 Mach 32,000. Why those conditions? Well, we knew that 1.4 was fairly representative of what a future supersonic airplane might be flying. That's about 1,100 miles per hour. And also, the F-5 could get to 1.4 Mach fairly easily. So even though we were going to modify the nose shape, we had confidence we could get there. And, and the 32,000 came from the fact that the floor of the high altitude corridor at, over Edwards Air Force Base is 30,000, so we wanted to give a little margin. So that's what drove the condition 32,000 1.4 Mach for the design condition for this project. After the engineers loaded the data in the computer and started doing the computational fluid analysis, CFD analysis they called it, they then started modifying the nose shape in the computer and started studying what the effect was on the various shock waves that were coming off the nose and the inlet of the aircraft. They then finally came to a shape that they said should be the right shape to control these shock waves, which should reduce the intensity of the nose shock wave by about, they estimated about one third. Now, they then took that data and that nose shape and built a model, a model about three times larger than this model, with the specialized nose shape. They then put that in the NASA supersonic wind tunnel called the NASA Glen Tunnel and took a look at what happened to the shock waves in the wind tunnel, and they found very close correlation between the wind tunnel results and the predicted mathematic results. So based on this, the engineers then went forth with confidence that they should be able to build a new nose shape, put it on an F-5, fly it supersonic over an array of microphones, measure the sonic signature, and it should show a reduced intensity of the forward shock uh, on the aircraft. 
Uh, a little shout out right now to some of the engineers that were pretty much involved. The management of making all this come together, I'll have to give a shout out to Charles Bucadero, the overall manager, and he was very closely uh, uh, helped by uh, Joe Pulowski and, and, and uh, the engineers then that did the computational work in the computer would be a Keith Meredith and the uh, aero engineer that was primarily responsible for the shaping of the nose and the final shaping would be an engineer named Mr. Dave Graham. So these guys spent uh, a lot of effort then to come up with this specialized shape. So now came time to actually construct the nose. And this was done by the engineers and technicians at uh, Northrop Grumman's facility in El Segundo, California. A gentleman named Chris uh, Yasaki and uh, Mark Smith were uh, two gentlemen that kind of headed up the construction layup for building this nose, which consisted of an aluminum substructure to build the frame, and then they put composite material on the outside for the skin. So aluminum substructure with composite material, and that was designed so it would attach right here to this, this bulkhead and, and a lot of the strength in to hold that nose would be done through this bulkhead uh, area that we see right here. Um, now, where to get an F5 to modify? It just so happened the Navy had a basic F5 aircraft uh, that, that they fly, of course, for their uh, Navy adversary work where they train Navy fighter pilots. And they had one of these airplanes up at Fallon, Nevada that was, had a pretty much used up its structural life. It was destined to go to the boneyard. It had a few hours of flying left on it, if you will. Uh, and so DARPA asked the Navy, could they have that aircraft to do this project? And the Navy said yes. So the airplane was then delivered to St. Augustine, Florida, to the Northrop Grumman facility at the St. Augustine Airport. And that's where Grumman before and then Northrop Grumman, when the two companies combined, started, had been doing modification work on the Navy adversary F-5s to just make sure they were structurally sound. Uh, and that facility then became the place where they were gonna take the nose section off of this, uh, of this F-5 that was delivered by the Navy and then put on the new nose shape that was being built in El Segundo. And that's what happened. El Segundo, or uh, the Northrop Grumman technicians, removed the nose. The El Segundo engineers, after they had completed the construction, then they sent that nose section out to St. Augustine, and then the nose section was put on the aircraft. Now that they had this new airplane all put together with its various parts and pieces, everybody stepped back and took a look and said, wow, that's ugly. <laughs> so uh, they actually painted it all white and it was still ugly, but a, 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 a female aerospace engineer at Northrop took a look at the, the picture of the F-5 one day and she applied her woman's touch and came up with this pinstripe that you see here to kind of help with the aesthetics. But there's more to this than just uh, uh, improving the aesthetics. This is actually a painting representing the planned final test results. For example, uh, in red we see what would be the sonic signature of this airplane of the shock waves as they reach the ground. There's the tail shock, there's the nose shock, and this is the so-called end wave of pressure that your ear hears. This is the boom, boom. Okay? Now, she also then represented in blue the anticipated results from this project in which we have a per the same tail shock, but the nose shock here, notice how it's flatter and it is only about, it's about one third reduced in intensity. So, uh, Joan uh, Yasijan was the aerospace uh, engineer that drew this up and it was used then as a painting on the side of the airplane. So I thought that was pretty cool that the engineers expressed the audacity to literally paint the final test results before the airplane even flew. Okay, now we had an airplane uh, ready to fly. So at St. Augustine in June, we, as a test team there, we started to uh, fly the airplane, taxi the airplane, did the flight, and uh, uh, took a look at the initial airworthiness. Um, 
Maybe I ought to, yeah, and so, uh, yeah, I took a look at the initial airworthiness of the airplane, and I'd like to give a shout out now to Boeing, because Boeing then brought a T-38 down from Seattle with their test pilot, um, uh, Mike Bryan, as the pilot, and he came to St. Augustine and then worked very closely with myself flying the test airplane to clear the initial envelope. We then, after we were confident this airplane was safe to fly, and oh, by the way, the airplane pretty much flew like an F-5F, which is the two-seat version of the F-5. And that makes sense since this airplane initially was designed to be no longer than an F-5F. And that was one of the constraints that we had put on, on the design because we didn't want to have stability issues with the plane. And so it flew very much like an F-5F. So after we proved the initial airworthiness, Mike Bryan then led me. I didn't have really hardly any avionics in the airplane other than standard flight instruments, a transponder, and a radio. Everything else had been taken out of the aircraft to, sell, to, you know, to save the weight, and of course a lot of that was up in this nose area. So anyway, uh, he led me on a delivery flight then when we finally delivered the airplane to Palmdale, California, to Palmdale Airport, to the Northrop Grumman facility there. All right, when we got there then, we started to complete the final phase of the test program to clear the envelope out to the 1.4 Mach at 32,000. Uh, a Navy test pilot joined me on this part of the test project. Commander Darrell, call sign Spike Long, and I then took turns flying the airplane out of Palmdale, NASA, Dryden, NASA Armstrong now, they supplied the chase aircraft for this phase of the program and we would go up into the Edwards High Altitude Supersonic Corridor and finally did clear the airplane out to its final condition, 32,000 1.4 Mach. So now we had an airplane safe to fly, ready to go. Now we're getting ready to finalize the test project to see if the test results would actually work. Now came uh, the phase in which they laid an array of microphones out on the desert floor uh, north of the Edwards uh, uh, Air Force Base complex there in, in a remote area, but it's directly under the high altitude supersonic corridor. And in addition, special instrumentation was put in the F-5, the, the test aircraft, so we would know exactly where this airplane was in relation to the array of microphones as we flew over the microphones and recorded the sonic booms. I'd like to give a shout out to a Mr. Ed Herring who uh, was the Northrop Dryden at that time, uh, engineer, uh, instrumentation engineer, and, and, and really kind of managed putting together this array of microphones and this instrumentation that was on this airplane to make sure we knew exactly the track that the airplane flew. Okay, now that we're ready for test, we then brought a basic F-5 down from Fallon uh, Nevada, flown by an, a Navy uh, adversary pilot named uh, uh, Lieutenant Commander Dwight Tricky, call sign Tricky Dick, last name Dick. Uh, uh, so Lieutenant Commander Dick then flew the basic airplane and I was uh, involved with flying the test aircraft. So on 27th of August of 2003, we take off from Palmdale, climb out over the Edwards complex, get into the high altitude quarter, and did our dive down to, want to pick up 1.4 Mach at 32,000. And Lieutenant Commander Dick spaced one minute behind me. So when I came over the array, they would collect the sonic signature of this aircraft. And then one minute later, using essentially the same atmospheric conditions, he would come over the array to do a baseline test so we could compare the two results. So what did the results look like? exactly what's shown on the side. The intensity of the forward sonic boom was reduced by about one-third. And not only was it a successful test, they hit the conditions exactly as predicted. And so that was pretty, uh, that, was, that, that was awesome. So now they had a lot of confidence that yes, you can control the sonic signature of an airplane, the sonic boom signature, using aircraft shaping. NASA got so excited now, they funded another 21 flights involving both this airplane and the baseline airplane doing back-to-back, -back, recorded over 1,200 sonic boom signatures uh, by the array over a course of about two weeks of testing in January of 2004. This airplane then was returned back to the Navy 
and was sent to St. Augustine and then it was turned over to the Navy uh, Aerospace Museum but it is on loan to the Valiant Museum uh, which is located uh, in, in, in Florida, uh, at, at the entry to uh, the Kennedy Space Center at Titusville, Florida. That's where the airplane resides today. Now, what about the future of supersonic flying? Well, NASA has now funded a project called the X-59. This airplane is designed, a clean sheet design from scratch to show that they have special shaping to control both the front and the shock and the rear shock so that both of those should be reduced to a level that will be uh, not a problem for supersonic flight. That airplane will also do a test primarily out to uh, 1.4 Mach at 32,000 feet. That airplane is currently under construction by Lockheed Martin at their facility in Palmdale Airport in Palmdale, California and should fly next year in 2021 and do their test to see if the concept worked. So, that's just an example of a modification to our basic F5. So please, come by the museum, check out our F5 we have here, and we'll share other stories with you. Thank you.